So he got called up in the very first call up. Yeah. Um, but he was allowed to defer until he'd finished his studies at Wagga. So once he'd finished his studies at Wagga, he went in to, because he was conscripted, he, he used to say it was the only raffle he ever won. <laughs> his marble came up, um, accepted it as um, that's what, what was being required of him. He'd had a um, uh, great uncle who'd been killed in the First World War and lies in one of the cemeteries in France. His father had served. So there was this sense of um, it's what you do. Yeah. Um, he certainly wasn't a rebel in any way. Um, accepted that he was not convinced about the politics of the situation, but in this case, it was required of him to do this. Yeah. So he accepted his conscription uh, and in 69 went in and did his basic training, Pakapanyal. Um, there, there's also, and Doug was adamant about this, that actually going to Vietnam as a conscript was your decision. Um, and he saw himself as trained, um, able to do it, and he had acute hearing, acute eyesight, so he was designated forward scout, okay. which means right at the head, head of the group going out to do their reconnaissance or whatever they did. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so landed in Vietnam, Tell me about how he was injured. Okay, so they were out on patrol. Uh, Doug was Ford Scout. Um, Doug came across a barbed wire fence, um, stopped, informed the higher up guys, you know, like his lieutenant, etc. Barbed wire, uh, was skeptical about what could be there. Decision made by um, the other people to go in. Um, so I think there were four of them went in, Lieutenant, Sergeant, Lieutenant um, Guy and Doug, and someone tripped a, a wire, a bomb wire, and mine went up. The same time mine went up, the Arvan, which was the South Vietnamese Army, on the other side of the minefield, um, realised it was in actual fact one of their own minefields, um, had gone up and started firing. So the messages had to go out, hang on guys, stop, this is friendlies in here. Um, and over the period of time that it took the sappers to come in and uh, defuse mines so that they could get to Doug, um, the other guys who'd been in the minefield with Doug blown up died. And so Doug was then medevac from there, uh, back to field hospital, uh, massive shrapnel wounds everywhere. And... He was the only one, wasn't he? That's right, that survived the incident. And then he didn't, like he's told me what had happened to him, but not elaborating, yeah. nothing else. Just, you know, he'd been hurt, minefield, that was it. It took some time as the relationship developed for him to try, start telling me more and more. Yeah, and I imagine that that was part of his recovery as well would have been to you know talk about it and that you were talking before about he was a bit skeptical about psychology and psychiatry, psychiatry um, 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 and, and then once he realized the difference <clears throat> and recognized the need for help yeah. <clears throat> because for example he was fortunate in that after he'd been hurt he made comfort and this was before I'd met him. He'd come from a small country town, very strong RSL, and Doug was welcomed back with open arms. Yeah. Um, he didn't, in Braidwood itself, come across <clears throat> any of the negativity or the nastiness yeah. that other returned veterans talked about. He certainly did later on, um, but not initially. Yeah. So yes, okay, so we talked, yeah, he got better at talking, mm. but it took time. It took time, yeah. So he only ever saw it as a positive. Mm.